Good evening and welcome to Premier 26 on July 20th of 2022. We've been going through the, specifically the internal mapper reality material. And uh, we're sort of at the point now where we're wrapping up our understanding of beliefs and how important they are. We're going to wrap that up tonight by zeroing in on it, beliefs as a system. And it's a hierarchy and understanding that there are beliefs that you have that are more important than other beliefs that are, have a higher priority. And this forms your uh, intricate, intricate belief system about your reality. Understanding this means that if you have a belief that doesn't serve you, you can go and change it. So along that line, we'll be looking at something that is called your lifelong script. So we have scripts that we've made since we were children, and we are now living them. And understanding how these scripts work and the fact that they're optional. You do not have to be that character in that play and achieving the end as written in the script. You can change the script. You can change everything about it. It's your, it's your script and you can change it. So we'll be doing that. But before we go into the, the content about the hierarchy of beliefs and into the discussion of uh, lifelong scripts, we're going to do our one minute meditation as usual. I like keeping that. And I did promise that at some point I will do a, uh, a session just on more guided meditations. And now that we're wrapping up on beliefs and we're going to be starting a whole new segment next week, I don't think I will do, um, I'll like to take a little break and go into uh, some guided meditations and talk about that a bit. But for tonight, we're going to do that one minute meditation. And remember to practice detachment. The skill is to stay focused, but not fixated. You're focused, but you're relaxed. Your intent, but that intention is very, very gentle, and it can change, and it's fluid, right? So when you get a thought, you don't resist it, you just accept it, and then let it go by. It's just going to float by like a cloud. So enjoy the one minute meditation, and then we'll go and wrap up on beliefs. So, see you later. We have beliefs, and perhaps I think the biggest array of beliefs that we have is from our early childhood. And sometimes uh, this is called the inner child. Um, there's lots uh, lots of great material out there. Um, Bradshaw did a whole series on the uh, inner child, and that would definitely be a worthwhile um, way of spending a weekend watching his videos on the importance of coming to terms with your inner child. 
What's some of the inner issues with the uh, inner child? Well, the fact that you had a very, very rudimentary understanding of the world. And in fact, some of these early, early childhood experiences, you may not even have had full uh, language. And you may not have understood uh, what things meant in the outside world. So when you when you're looking at frames from your really early years, particularly like uh, before you were even a toddler, the frames and the memories that you get uh, may be kind of difficult to interpret because they won't come they, uh, because they weren't developed by an adult. So we'll be talking about this, and particularly we'll be talking about frames that are associated with root cause events that you had as a child that shaped your development or lack of development. So people talk about arrested development. If, if there was an experience that you had in your early childhood, it might stop your development. Well, going back magically and correcting or adjusting the, the frames, because you can't change the events, but you can change the memory of them. You can ground and clean up your timeline of these root cause events. These events don't all have to be negative. Some of them are very, very powerful. Some of these root cause events uh, make you into who you are today, and give you a sense of self, and maybe are a source of your power. So just as a you know, little bit of observation here is that when you're looking at your frames from the past and looking on at the present and the future you know don't don't change the frames just to change them don't don't become um, a busybody like or a bull in the china shop be respectful for all your memories and assume first that a frame is there for a reason and you leave it alone you just want to understand it it's only when you begin to understand that the frame is unresourceful and it needs to be enhanced that you make changes. So as we're progressing with this course, learn to be the silent, neutral observer, observe the frames, and only change things in your internal map that you feel need to be changed. Let's not be bulls in those china shops. So these frames can develop into beliefs. And so what we really want to be able to do is have all of our beliefs in our map to be resourceful and powerful. Now, that's going to take a lot of work, but it's not that difficult because if you meditate and pay attention to how you feel during the day, moment to moment, and you become aware of when you don't feel good, when you become aware of when you're having some kind of pain, either physical, emotional, energetic, or spiritual, when you're having pain, it quite likely is the result of a frame, of a, of a desire that produced a belief about the world. Okay? So understanding if you have inner desires that are what I call away from. So if you have, because of past trauma, desires that are avoidance, right, that you can't accept. Okay, so we will, these are easy to find, but they're not necessarily easy to work with. So we're not going to start with really big issues in your, in your life. We're not going to start off with the big guys. We'll start off with the small ones, right? Remember, start small and work big. Um, so, what would be uh, the makeup of a resourceful belief? Well, the desire should be strong. And as mentioned earlier in the earliest parts of this presentation, of this session, is that the belief should be a fairly general, strong desire. Um, so what would be a good one? helping other people. That's, that's one a lot of people have as a desire. I want to help people. But the stronger that desire, the more beliefs that you will develop. Okay, so you develop the belief 
about helping others. So what would be a resourceful belief? Well, you might believe that donating um, money and time and resources to organizations that help others is a belief. You might strongly believe that and go out and do that. You might believe that when walking around the street that you will interact with anyone that appears to be in need and assess whether or not there's any way that you can help them. Again, a really resourceful belief will go from the general down to the specific, from the macro down to the micro. The macro would be a general belief, working down to a whole series of beliefs, how to satisfy that desire, and then the uh, micro would be specific things. And one of the things that I keep mentioning is that if you have a desire, you develop beliefs, how to, do, how to satisfy the desire, you have to accept all the outcomes from that and, and move on. Okay, so let's look at this, what I call the subconscious belief system. So the way it works is it's kind of like a core where you have a desire and then off of that desire, you get beliefs are spun off to achieve or to meet that uh, desire. So this is why I say the more general your desire, the more beliefs that you will develop that will match. Okay? So it's, it's kind of like increasing your odds for success. So you develop uh, a, a core belief that's general enough so that you can have a huge array of beliefs about how to satisfy it. Um, we will talk more about that, but this is basically the way it works. So you have a belief such as saying, wanting to be in a relationship. That's a nice general statement. It, you're not saying, I want to be in a relationship with this particular person, or I want to be in a relationship in this particular manner, in this particular location. And by this, but no, you're not doing any of that. You're just saying, I want a relationship. I want to be in a relationship. So out of that, your subconscious would automatically start generating uh, beliefs about identity. You should look at the way you dress and your parents maybe dress and to match the people you want in your life. And then maybe, maybe you need to meet with key people. Maybe there are people that you know that can introduce you to others. And then you might have a belief that says, well, I need to watch more Netflix movies. Well, maybe not all these beliefs are more efficient. Of these three, which one do you think would be the most efficient or the most likely to produce results? Changing your dress, the way you dress and your appearance? Um, meeting with people who know lots of people and can maybe uh, set you up on a, um, a date, a blind date, or watching more Netflix movies. Well, I know what I think is number one, two, and three, but I'd be interested to hear what you think. So the idea of having a lifelong script is really connected to your subconscious realm. These scripts run in the background. Uh, computer programmers might call them a subprogram or a background process. So you have a lot of these processes that you don't have to monitor in real time, but they have an impact on you in your awake conscious state. So we'll be covering that a little bit, and then we'll talk about inner desires and how these scripts are really trying to uh, satisfy a desire, much like our belief system is trying to satisfy our inner desires. Our scripts are trying to put together an elaborate scenario, almost like a little video or a little film or a little play in which our desires are met. Some of them are very resourceful, although the ones I'm interested in today are unresourceful beliefs or unresourceful scripts. And 
they are kind of the same. So you believe that doing these things will meet your desires, but there are unresourceful ones. So we could call them unresourceful scripts or unresourceful beliefs. And I'm going to use an example of one that's very, very common, and you might be able to relate to it, called the victim triangle script. And then finally, we'll just talk in general about lifelong scripts and how with your internal map of reality, you can start to identify resourceful scripts from unresourceful ones and what tools you will have to enhance your scripts and to make them all resourceful for you. So as we've been talking along, the 10% of our conscious mind uh, really isn't doing all the work. We're just observing. So your conscious mind is, is like I, I, the example I use as the flashlight in a dark room where you're just putting a spot of light in a vast, vast area. It's in the subconscious that these scripts run. And a lot of people won't even know that they have a script running in their subconscious. And when you say to them, you know, um, you seem to repeat this process over and over again. It seems like you're always doing the same thing. So one example of a, of a repetitive script is where you keep dating the same kind of person and having a similar kind of result or getting, getting jobs and always ending up such that you have to quit your job or you get fired. Or, and again, I'm talking about unresourceful scripts because those are the ones that limit us. If you have successful resourceful scripts, we don't really need to talk about them. They're good. It's the ones that are unresourceful that we need to target. So these, these scripts, as I said earlier, are all trying to meet your inner desires. So you want something and you want it really bad. And so you create a scenario based on your belief that if I do this script, I will get what I want. But again, talking about unresourceful scripts, I'm reminded again of that young young boy that was in my drama class. It was actually a, a creative movement class. And his script said that every time people were doing something, he had to over-participate. He had to overreact, be the loudest, stand in the middle of the group, and dominate. And that was his script, and that's what he did every all the time. So that was an example of a little script, but it was very, very unresourceful. And the result of it is, yes, he did get attention. Yes, people did pay attention to him, but he got negative attention. People were very upset with him, and quite often uh, they would say things to him. The scripts I'm interested in today are ones that are a little bit more involved. There are scripts that uh, you repeat over and over again, but they're a little bit more elaborate. Um, for those of you who are interested in doing more research on this, you can look up something called Games People Play. Just Google that or search for that, and you'll find all kinds of information about the, this process. And sometimes they're called games, but, but I like to call them scripts. So the unresourceful ones are based on a belief that if you do this, you will get these, your desires met. But the problem is you're on a treadmill. You keep doing the same thing over and over and over, expecting to get the result. But you never quite get the result. You get something else. This is also connected to making those three wishes, but you end up getting the opposite of what you wished for. So this all involves in how you're communicating with your subconscious. And we will, again, uh, later on in our internal map of reality course, we're going to drill into this a bit deeper. But think of yourself or someone you know, and sometimes it's called being in a rut. And you notice people will do the same thing or a similar thing. Now, it's slightly different. The, the faces will change. The names are different to protect the innocent. But the script is the same. So let me give you an example of a very powerful script that you might be able to to realize. And it's called the Victim Triangle Script. This is a well-known script, well-documented. If you, again, do a internet search for Victim Triangle, you'll see reams of information about it. 
So we'll use this as one example of scripts. I'm not going to get into how to disable the script. I just want to identify it. And later on in our in our modules, we'll talk about how to disable and, and how to realign scripts. But let's look at this one. So there's three parts to it. There is, at the very bottom, a victim. So to have a victim triangle, you need a victim. But in order to have a victim, you also need someone to persecute or something to persecute that victim. So you need a persecutor. And you need, of course, the rescuer, someone that will come in with the cape like Superwoman and save you. So um, I, I heard one thing just, just an hour ago from my son who, a friend of his, did something that was very, very dangerous, almost life-threatening, to become a victim and to try to force his uh, girlfriend to pay attention to him. If I do this, I will become very disarmed. So he acted like the victim, hoping that his friends and his girlfriend would want to come in and rescue him. But because the girlfriend did not respond, she became the persecutor. So he's in this position, almost killed himself. Well, in my opinion, it looked like he could have very easily done it. Uh, did some very reckless things to draw attention to himself. The people that rescued him this time were his friends. They came in and uh, you know got his attention and went to his place and saw his posts on the uh, social media that he was in, you know, real serious problems. And they came in and rescued him. And, of course, Hugh was the persecutor, his girlfriend. But let's look at another scenario. You might know someone that always seems to need your help, and you are the rescuer. But all it takes is that one time that you don't come in and rescue them, that they will do what? They will turn you into the persecutor. They will say, well, Steve, I was in really, really, didn't you get my, my emails and my phone calls? Like, I was really, really needed your help. I needed that $20 or $30, whatever. And because you didn't respond to me, I was not able to blah, 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 blah. So they blame you for something that you, because you did not become a rescuer again. So this, this process uh, is, is quite a classic one. So you might be the rescuer at some point and helping someone, or you might be a victim looking for someone to come in and save you, or you might be the victim, victim who points the finger at someone as being the reason that you are in your nasty situation. Or you might be the persecutor who points your finger at someone and says, well, you know, you wouldn't be in this position if, 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 you know. Or you might be the persecutor who points your finger at a rescuer and says, don't help these people, they blah, 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 blee. So you can play any of these roles. Now, I want to mention here that it's not that any one of these roles are good or bad. If you're a victim because you've been uh, in some way hurt, that's a valid situation. There's nothing you can do about it. And if you're the type of person that wants to help people, that's great. Go and help those people. So if you're a victim, accept help. If you're a rescuer, go help people. And if you're one of these people that looks around and says, um, like throwing cold water on people's faces and saying, look, don't go and rescue that person. And you know, stop being a victim. If you want to be that sort of reality person, that's okay too. So none of these roles are inherently good or bad. They're just roles, okay? And the script isn't necessarily good or bad. It's either resourceful or unresourceful. The bottom line is, if you need to be a victim to survive and to get through your day and to do what you got to do, hopefully at the end of it, you are healed. Now, if you have a script that keeps repeating, and at the end of it, uh, people are upset, you made people persecutors, and unjustly so, or people begin to feel that they've been rescuing you one too many times, or as a victim, you yourself feel at the end of this process, the end of the script, you might feel uh, sad or something was missing. 
So the point here is that these scripts will, can run very, very uh, short periods. They can run for an, uh, an hour, but a lot of them will run for weeks, months, even years. There are people who play the role of the victim their entire lives. And we're going to talk about why scripts would get in place and last an entire lifetime. We're going to talk about your timeline and the root cause event. Something triggered that person to be a persecutor, a rescuer, or a victim. And if it's not resourceful for you to be any one of these characters, and you know, put beer in mind, you might be all three of them. You might see yourself uh, over the life of a script being a victim, then being a persecutor, and then being a rescuer. It's quite common that victims become persecutors and change the rescuer into a victim. Anyway, it's an interesting script. Keep your eye open for it. And if you uh, see yourself being any one of these threes, examine and see if this is a repetitive script. These scripts can last your entire lives. And this is why, you know, in this course, I want you to really begin to look at yourself and to say, am I running a script that's unresourceful? And am I running a script that has a bad ending? Am I making a film with a bad... So you have this opportunity to redo the film, to change the script, to, to update the characters, and to end it in a real positive and resourceful way. So that's what we'll be doing. I just wanted to introduce this topic. And so pay attention to it. Do some more research. And we will um, be coming into this topic, I believe, under meta programs. But in any event, we will be going into this in great Thank you. And we will see you in the next session.